parents bought a house in uh, Troy, Michigan, where I ended up growing up and going to school. And whoever lived in the house before was a great gardener, and there were many. There was a big garden in the back with, I remember, asparagus and other things. And trees, fruit trees. There were cherry trees, sour cherries. And as time went, my father also planted trees because he liked plums and, and apricots and so forth. So he always had fruit all over the backyard. But my favorite fruit, because the cherries were sour, the plums had a hard time getting ripe, uh, were the berries that grew on the neighbor's property. <laughs> and they had wild raspberries growing in one corner, and they also had, they were great gardeners too, and they had luscious strawberries that they would grow. And I, when I was a little kid, they would invite me over to have strawberries fresh off the vine. We dip it in the powdered sugar, and that was like heaven, especially for a little boy. But I would also sneak over to the corner of my lot, and I could reach, because I was small enough, I could reach through the chain link fence and grab those wild raspberries they had in their backyard, and they were the best. Out of all the ones, they were the best. And if ever I was wandering in my adventures in the fields and woods, if I found wild raspberries, they were not any left by the time I got done with them. And so, uh, last year, I finally tried to make a dream come true and I planted raspberries in my backyard. And I had this little plot where I figured, well, they'll stay nice and contained in there and they'll grow. The first year they didn't do anything, not surprisingly, right? But this year they went crazy and this raspberry bushes, there was two of them, turned into this monster that was like the kraken coming out of the ocean. <laughs> Just huge. And the fruit came in very full, but the fruit was always, was always pink. It never got that red, ripe red. And for a long time, I wasn't sure. Maybe it's just not ripe yet. And I looked online, pink raspberries. Is that normal? Is that normal? Because I would go and I would taste them, and they were, they were like super tart, but they were edible. They weren't sweet. They weren't good. And that was it. By, the time, by now, they're all gone. The plant is, the plant is kaput, pretty much. I whacked it all back, and hopefully next year we'll get some. Maybe I need to put something in the soil. I don't know. But fruit, fruit, that precious, precious gift of God was there. And if you want to understand the parable of the sower, you have to understand the meaning of the fruit. Because that's the most important part. We call it the parable of the sower or the parable of the seed, but you've got to remember those are means to an end. The end of the story is what? that those who had a good heart bore fruit with much patience and good fruit. That was the whole point of it. That was the whole goal. And the thing that distinguishes that final group of people who hear the word of God and keep it and hold it fast and bear fruit with much patience, the difference is none of the others bore any fruit. The first never even got started. The second wither for lack of death and debt lack of moisture, lack of nourishment. The third, well, they bore fruit, but it was the fruit of the thorns. It was the bad fruit. It was not fruit that was ripened and rich. No fruit was, no good fruit was brought to maturity. So in essence, the third is just like the other two. And only the fourth stands apart. Brothers and sisters, this is very, very important. If we look throughout the New Testament in particular, of course, in the Old Testament, the, the image of fruit is very powerful, and, and from the very beginning, in Genesis, right? The earth bore fruit according to its kind. It's a sign of God's grace. But throughout the New Testament, the Lord, in the Gospels, uses this metaphor of fruit for our spiritual life. And for our salvation, in fact. And the Apostles also all draw on this idea of fruit. So let's take a look real quick. Besides the parable of the sower, the Lord also speaks in a number of places. In Luke chapter 6, for example, he says, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. 
A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Keep that one in mind. There's good fruit and there's bad fruit. Of course, the parable of the sower is interested only with the good fruit. And that fruit comes out of where? The heart. It's in the heart that this is all taking place. In Luke chapter 13, the Lord also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Why are you wasting the good soil on this plant that bears no fruit? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, very good, very well. After that, you can cut it down. So this is the wisdom of the Lord, the patience of the Lord, the gentleness of the Lord, to remind us, maybe we in our lives do not see ourselves bearing much fruit. Well, don't despair yet. Don't, don't cut yourself down yet. Don't give up. First, you've got to make sure you're treating your life correctly. Dig around it, meaning keep stuff out that doesn't belong there. Weed your garden. Put up a little, little barriers. We try to put a little barrier out there in front of our sign so that the that really thick grass wouldn't come in, but it, it leaked over and took over anyway. So somebody told me, said, Father, you just need to dig up all of the soil, then put a barrier, then put brand new soil, because it's just too overgrown. And sometimes that's what you have to do. But you don't have to destroy the whole garden. And fertilize it was the other thing. If we're not feeding our spiritual lives, we're not feeding our heart with things that will nourish us, then how do we expect our spiritual lives to grow? And by the way, what is the most effective fertilizer? You all know, you don't want to say it, you're in church. That's how life really works. The foul-smelling refuse of life is the very thing which you are called to turn into the most healthy and nourishing. So when you go through some stuff, turn it into fertilizer, mulch it into your garden, make it into good. What sufferings, what calamities, what difficulties, what humiliations, whatever it is, take it, don't be afraid of it. It smells bad at first, but you know what? You bury it in your soil and work it into your soil and of your heart, it will become something that will help bear you, bear you fruit in time. Okay, now let's get a little scarier maybe. John 15 is a very important passage, verses 1 through 8. The Lord says, I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So the pruning is similar to that fertilizing and digging. It's trimming that which is not helpful. Notice that he says every branch in me. This is even assuming you're already in Christ. This is not just saying those who aren't attached to me. This is even those who are attached to me. Even those who are Christians, if they do not bear fruit, he takes away. He cuts them off. He prunes them. Therefore, he says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. I have pruned you with my word. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. This is another very important point. When we talk about bearing fruit and spiritual labor and spiritual difficulty, we're not talking about you trying to do this on your own. We're talking about remembering who we are attached to. Who is the foundation of our life? We're just a branch. Christ is the trunk, the true vine. Every bit of life that we have, spiritually, blessings, virtues, no matter what it is, it comes from our relationship to Jesus Christ, and it's on Him that we must depend. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. You know what I'm talking about. 
But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So we have to be bearing fruit in order to really be disciples of Christ. You can't be fruitless fig trees. What did the Lord say on his way to Jerusalem when he saw the fig tree that bore no fruit? He cursed the fig tree for bearing no fruit and it withered and died on the spot. What he was basically saying is, those people who had worked in my name, built temples in my name, kept the rituals in my name of the law, but bore no fruit, rejected me, plotted to crucify me, they are not of me. There is judgment in this life. That's what he said. And our fruit will bear witness to us. Or our lack thereof. Now what is the fruit? We've talked about it. But what is it? Romans, St. Paul in Romans 6 says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So the bad fruit is a poison fruit. There's a reason we tell our kids not to eat any berry they see. And we should do the same spiritually. Some fruits will kill us. They'll kill us spiritually first, and if we don't watch ourselves, they can even kill us physically and legally. But the devil doesn't care. He knows we're going to die anyway. He cares the first time that we die spiritually. First. But, St. Paul says, now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Life and death. That's what we're talking about in terms of these fruits. Fruit is holiness. Fruit is righteousness. Fruit is everlasting life. The fruit, the tree of life. When Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, they were cast out so that, having fallen into sin, they would not then eat the tree of life and therefore be stuck eternally in sin. God allows us to die in this life so that there can be an end to sin. But it's not the end of existence for us if we have partaken of that tree of life in this life through Christ Jesus, we have the life beyond. In Galatians 5, St. Paul says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So instead of just having cherries or raspberries or strawberries, you have all of these fruits. All of these fruits that you can bear in your life. Some of us may bear more of some than others. Some of us may bear only a few. Some may bear a little bit of everything. Nonetheless, this is what you want to look for in your life. If you don't have these things, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, that's real patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, then you have to ask yourself, what fruit are you growing? What fruit is coming? And is that fruit giving you life, or is it poison to your heart? Remember, out of the abundance of the heart comes the fruit. So if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. They have pruned, they have cut off the dead fruits. And in Ephesians 5, we read, for you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk, therefore, as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding now what is acceptable to the Lord. And James says, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. <clears throat> so, brothers and sisters, we go back to the parable of the sower. In the first three fruits, there's no, the first three seeds grow up and bear no fruit. If they have no fruit, they have no life. If they have no life, then what do they have? Eternal death. Yes. 
that? <laughs> Be watchful, for you know not the hour when your cell phone will ring. <laughs> Even the third one, which looks promising because all this stuff grows up in it, still has no fruit. It's only thorns, it's only brambles, it's only the bad and poison fruit, not the good fruit that gives life. So we must be very careful. Let us not say, well, hey, at least I'm a Christian, at least I have good intentions, at least I'm a nice person. That's not enough. What is salvation? Salvation is not just God gave you a pass and let you continue on in your sinful ways because you said the magic formula or you pledged the magic pledge or you went and did the magic ritual. Salvation is to be completely transformed in the light of the Holy Spirit, back into the likeness of God in which you were created at the very beginning. Without the transformation of the human being, inside our hearts first, and then outward through our acts, through our works, through our love for other people, because faith without works is dead. Without that transformation of the human being, there, that's, there's no salvation in that. There's no life in that. That's a, that's a barren tree that gives no fruit. So brothers and sisters, let us be very mindful today when we read these Gospels and hear these passages of the Scripture. And now that it is the time of the harvest in October and all our plants are, are dying off with the cold, let us take stock of the fruit, not just in our gardens, but in our hearts. And say, what are we bringing into this world? Through Christ Jesus. Amen.